Hello and welcome to this video presentation of our paper titled From Geometrically to Algebraically Described Hyperbolic Paraboloids, an optimization-based analysis of the Phillips Pavilion. Hyperbolic paraboloid surfaces can be described both geometrically and algebraically. While it can be straightforward to translate an algebraic description of a hyperbolic paraboloid into a geometric one, however, doing the opposite is not as straightforward as one might expect. The hyperbolic paraboloid surfaces of the 1958 Phillips Pavilion, for example, have so far only been described geometrically, but not in terms of algebraic parameters. We are Thomas Fischer and Thomas Wortmann from Xi'an Jiao Tong Liverpool University, and in this video presentation we will outline a procedure we developed to go from geometric to algebraic descriptions of hyperbolic paraboloids using computational optimization in parametric modeling as a key method and using the Phillips Pavilion as an example. The Phillips Pavilion, designed by Le Corbusier and Yanis Senakis for the 1958 Brussels World Fair, stands out as an iconic example of advanced, non-standard architecture based on doubly ruled surfaces. Despite having been realized without the aid of digital design tools, it prefigured recent computer-aided design and production strategies, in particular by using double-curved and double-ruled surfaces to achieve expressive form that can nonetheless be fabricated and constructed along straight lines. To reconcile their aesthetic ambitions for the pavilion with requirements and constraints related to its fabrication and construction, as well as to its structural performance, Le Corbusier and Zenakis composed the pavilion as an arrangement of nine hyperbolic paraboloids. The hyperbolic paraboloid is a mathematically defined, double-curved surface resembling the saddle shape of a potato chip. Algebraically, it is defined by the equation shown here, according to which, for every point in the xy plane in a three-dimensional coordinate system, there is a distance to this surface in the third dimension z, based on two quadratic coefficients a and b, which determine the surface's parabolic curvature along the x and y axis respectively. The hyperbolic paraboloid owes its name to its property of intersecting with horizontal planes along hyperbolas, while intersecting with vertical planes along parabolas. The inflection points of the parabolas intersect at the centroid of the hyperbolic paraboloid, which, according to the equation mentioned earlier, is located at the origin of the coordinate system. Being curved in two directions, the hyperbolic paraboloid also follows straight lines. Hyperbolic paraboloid applications in architecture are typically based on geometric descriptions of four straight parameter lines spanned by a grid of straight lines between them. This allows their construction along string lines or lasers and it provides straight load paths in structural shells. In the following, we will discuss our procedure for taking geometric descriptions of hyperbolic paraboloids in terms of straight lines and translate them into algebraic descriptions in terms of quadratic coefficients, spatial locations and orientations. Using the Phillips Pavilion as an example, we will initially construct the missing souterrain parts of most of its surfaces, then we will extend the grid of ruling lines outward identify the principal parabolas, analyze those parabolas to find their quadratic coefficients and, finally, reconstruct the hyperbolic paraboloid surface algebraically. Zenakis published a floor plan drawing from which we took most of the coordinates of key points of the pavilion visually. The heights of the three pinnacles is given numerically in the drawing. Surfaces A through F intersect the ground plane so that each of them has a vertex at an unknown souterrain location that we need to find first. This will give us four straight parameter lines for each of the surfaces so that we can then go ahead and construct grids of straight ruling lines between them. In this context, the surfaces of the pavilion fall into three different categories. For the first category, all four vertices are located in the ground plane or above. They are covered in Sinakis's drawing and therefore known. Surfaces in the second category are circumscribed by two straight lines and a curve in the ground plane. 
To complete this kind of surface, we place a fourth vertex arbitrarily at a souterrain location and then optimize the location of that vertex such that the intersection points between the resulting grid of ruling surfaces and the ground plane approximates the floor plan curve in Xenakis's drawing. In this and in most other optimization processes in this procedure, we used three different optimization algorithms successively. First, the global RBF opt in Opossum, second, the global CMA ES also in Opossum, and third, the local Bobiqua in GOAT, Opossum and GOAT being optimization plugins in Rhino Grasshopper. Surfaces in the third category are circumscribed by three straight lines and a curve in the ground plane. In this case, we locate the fourth point on a souterrain extension of one of the ground intersecting straight lines and optimize its location on that extension using the same optimization sequence and objective as described before. Now we have the missing souterrain portions of surfaces A through F constructed. This step has led to some interesting observations. Xenakis writes that he used a special made tool consisting of two metal spokes connected by several elastic strings to model the pavilion surfaces such that he could produce projection drawings of the surfaces including the curves in the ground plane. According to our analysis, assuming Xenakis was working at a likely model scale of 1 to 50, the tool would have had to extend across almost 7 meters in the case of surface F. We are aiming to analyze the parabolas in the pavilion surfaces. This task is much easier if we can work from sections of parabolas that include their inflection points. The Phillips pavilion surfaces, however, tend to be somewhat removed from the centroids of their respective hyperbolic paraboloids and thus from the inflection points of their principal parabolas. To address this, we must extend the grid of ruling lines of each surface. We perform this extension parametrically with visual feedback to ensure that each extending grid of ruling lines extends across the centroid of the respective hyperbolic paraboloid. Next, we need to identify the parabolic section curves in each surface. For each surface, we first locate the centroid of the four vertices of that surface. Then, we place an orthogonal configuration of two planes on this vertex in order to check the intersections between the two planes and our previously extended surface. The two intersection curves we obtain in this way are then copied along each other to obtain a grid of curves. We now optimize the rotation of the orthogonal configuration of two planes to approximate the extended surface with our grid of copied intersection curves. Once we have obtained a close approximation of the extended surface, we know that the intersection curves are segments of the parabolas we are after, or at least they approximate these parabolas closely. Next, we must analyze these parabola segments. This analysis benefits from the inflection points being included in the parabola sections, which we ensured previously when we extended the grids of ruling lines. To find each parabola's inflection point, we place two points of a circle and that circle's center point on the parabola segment. Then, we move the circle along the parabola segment and compare the two portions of the parabola divided by the circle's center point within the circle. The location of the circle is optimized with the objective of both parabola sections being equal in length. In this way, the center point of the circle will arrive at the parabola's inflection point. We now move the parabola from its inflection point to the origin of coordinates and rotate the parabola around the origin to align it with the xz plane. When moving and rotating the parabolas at this step, we record these movement vectors and rotation angles for later use. We then take a set of samples from the parabola and feed their coordinates into NumPy's polyfit function to determine the parabola's quadratic coefficient. Now we can return to the pavilion and generate a hyperbolic paraboloid algebraically using the quadratic coefficients of the two parabolas identified for each given surface.
the algebraically generated hyperbolic paraboloid is now in its standard orientation with its centroid on the origin of coordinates. We now refer back to the movements and rotations we performed previously in preparing the analysis of the parabola segments and apply the reverse movement and rotations on the algebraically generated hyperbolic paraboloid. Now we have obtained a hyperbolic paraboloid that is described in terms of its quadratic coefficients, its location and spatial orientation. It approximates the geometrically described surface in question very closely. We can improve its fit by optimizing its algebraic parameters within narrow margins and obtain a very close match with the pavilion surface in question. We perform this procedure on all surfaces of the Phillips pavilion and thereby arrived, we believe for the first time, at an algebraic parameter set describing the surfaces of the Phillips pavilion. While the procedure we have outlined here may appear relatively simple and straightforward, we experienced our search for it as anything but simple and straightforward. At various points, geometric challenges and vast solution spaces seemed almost insurmountable. No doubt we would have failed in this quest without access to Rhino, Grasshopper and the above-mentioned optimization plugins. We regard the possibility to not only perform but to also develop such procedures within the same environment as a testament to the power of the parametric design and optimization toolkit both in terms of automated search and epistemological enablement and cannot help but wonder what Zenakis and Le Corbusier would have accomplished had they had the opportunity of using it. Thank you for watching. We are looking forward to your questions and comments.